All right. We'll make a uh, segue now over to our uh, Torah portion, Kitisa. Uh, and I'll uh, try to keep my part as uh, brief as possible. Uh, what you have in uh, chapter uh, uh, 31 of Kitisa, in many ways, is a uh, a loose repetition of the first chapter of the Bible. And you'll know from mine and Sherry's teaching, we see this uh, a great deal, the interreferential nature of the Bible. So what do we have in the beginning of uh, uh, chapter uh, 31, Exodus 31? Uh, we have God calling out Bitzalel, and as I explained in my Shabbat thought, Bitzalel breaks down into Be. Tzal, a shadow or image, El, in the shadow image of God. And therefore, we have here a reference to the original human beings who are created B'Tselem Elohim, in the image of God. So uh, B'Tsal El is actually given the name that uh, is referred to them. Uh, they own, by the way, they only gain the names in chapters 2 and 3. Adam is called uh, Adam in chapter Genesis chapter 2. And uh, Eve is only called Eve at the end of three or the beginning of four. I don't recall exactly which. Um, and uh, it says here uh, that uh, God, uh, 31.3, that God has filled the Bitzalel with godly spirit, uh, Ruach Elohim. Uh, you may remember the Ruach Elohim, Rachefet al Panehom, the, the Ruach of uh, the divine hovering over the face of the deep. Uh, it says he's filled him, Amale Oto, Bechokma, with wisdom, Tivuna, uh, discernment or understanding, Uvedaat, uh, knowledge. Of course, this takes us back to Etadat Tovara, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This seems to be either connected to or some kind of different Da'at. It's not the knowledge of good and evil, unless that is somehow connected with the knowledge of beauty because that is what Betzalel has the expertise in, is to take these ideas and render them into a, a beautiful form. And then, then it says, Bechol melacha, in uh, all toil, at the end of uh, the, the uh, first um, chapter of Genesis, we, we are, makes us known that we don't do any melacha on Shabbat, any uh, toil on Shabbat. And then it goes on and says, Lachshov machshavot, now, the Hebrew terms lakshov makshavot literally means to think thoughts, but the, uh, the uh, origins of the Hebrew word lakshov makshavot probably means to weave. And it's interesting that as the Hebrew language developed and they were trying to come up with a word for, for thought, they use the same word as to weave. Uh, so you'll find the idea of thinking already over in Chronicles, which is then retrojected back to earlier parts of the Bible, but in earlier parts of the Bible, the work Lachshov has a sense of weaving, and we can see the brilliance in taking the term weaving to describe uh, 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 human thought. Uh, it says, um, uh, the carving of stones, uh, uh, and and the carving of trees. So here we, we have all of these uh, natural elements in the Garden of Eden, for example, the tree, the stones, etc., uh, they will now be lacharosh, which means to, to carve them. Uvechol melacha. So Betzalel is uh, the one who is skilled using uh, chokmah, tevuna, and dat to take what you might call the elements of the Garden of Eden and create with them uh, something beautiful, but will also be a place to house the divine. Now, I want to read uh, uh, one uh, uh, little section from Job and then bring this back to our portion. In our Midrash for today, the Midrash is of two minds. One of part of the Midrash today is God showing to Adam all of the different people whom God will choose to serve God. And what you get from reading that part of the Midrash is a sense of uh, destiny, is that God has already chosen all of those who will serve God. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is a midrash that says God doesn't know whom God specifically is going to choose. In fact, God goes looking for the unique person who can take these divine thoughts that God has given to Moshe and find the exact right person 
who can render these thoughts into uh, our world. So if you'd like to go with me, you can see this extraordinary verse from the book of Job. You're going to have to jump all the way over to Job uh, chapter 28, uh, verse 12. Job chapter 28, verse 12. Well, where is the book of Job? You have to go to the third part of the Bible called the writings. You have the Psalms, you have the Proverbs, and then you have the book of Job. After the book of Job come the five scrolls. So if you're looking, Psalms, Proverbs, Job. Job is a very long book, a very interesting, fascinating book. We've taught it a few times. We'll teach it again. But look in Job chapter 12. It's a, it's a fascinating chapter. Um, uh, um, it, it says here, this is uh, Job's uh, praise of wisdom. Uh, Job says, He says, Wisdom, from, from nothingness does it come. By the way, the Kabbalists love this because uh, in the Kabbalah, Ayin is one of the names of the highest Sphira, sometimes called Keter, sometimes called Machshava, sometimes called Ayin, pure nothingness sometimes called the Ein Sof. The next Sfira, as most of you know, is called a Chokmah. So the Kabbalists make this a play on words. It says, Me'ayin Va'chokmah, Me'ayin Timatzeh, Chokmah, from where does it come? It comes from the first Sfira, Ayin, goes down in Chokmah. We're going to put that aside. That's a Kabbalistic play. But the question here is, where does it come from? Uh, why are some people philosophically wise? They're not philosophically wise because they read books of philosophy. They read books of philosophy because they're already wise. Uh, you find, when I think of the wisdom of Plato and Aristotle, they didn't read and then one day become wise. They wrote because they had something called chokmah, uh, it, as it were some, some part of their character that the uh, divine spirit uh, had endowed them with. So this idea of, of, of what is the quality of chokmah, which at some level means the, uh, at the lowest level you might say, the technical ability to render thought into beauty. The technical ability to render thought into beauty. And then as the word goes on and on, it turns into the realm of, the, of, of mystical apprehension. For example, the idea of the chokmah shel mala, the, uh, the upper wisdom. So you have this idea of the chokmah throughout uh, Greco-Roman, Jewish thought, Stoic thought, all throughout the philosophy of, uh, prior to Christianity, and then it becomes a, a, a core part of uh, the thought of the Church Fathers all the way through the history of, uh, of Christianity. So it goes on in, uh, in Job chapter 28. Humankind does not know its worth. It cannot be found in the land of the living. I'm still in Job uh, 28. The depth says, it's not in me. And the sea says, it's not with me. Precious gold cannot be exchanged for it. Its price cannot be weighed in silver. You can't buy wisdom for any price. You're not going to find it at the bottom of the sea. Uh, you're not going to find it in the depths of the earth. It cannot be compared to Ophir gold, to precious shoham or sapphire. Gold and glass cannot approximate it, nor can ex exchange be in golden articles. Corals and crystals cannot be considered. The pursuit of wisdom is more precious than pearls. The pit, the pit da, a, a precious stone of Kush, cannot approximate it. The purest gold cannot be compared to it. Wisdom, from where does it come? Which is the place of understanding? It is hidden from the eyes of all living things and concealed from the bird of heaven. Doom and death say, With our ears we have heard of his reputation. Only God understands its way. Only God knows its place. For God peers to the ends of the world. God sees what is under the entire heavens, making a prescribed weight for the wind, 
apportioning water with a measure. When God makes a set allotment for the rain and a path for the clouds of thunder. Then he looked and recorded it. He prepared it and perfected it. And then God said to man, Behold, the awe of Adonai is wisdom, and refraining from evil is understanding it. Now, what does the Midrash do? The Midrash takes Job chapter 28, verse 27. I'll go over to the Hebrew for just a moment. And it says, Azra'a, and then God saw. Vayesapra, <clears throat> and recounted, or told. Hechina, uh, and prepared. Vagam hakara, and also investigated deeply. Now, this is a wonderful verse that the rabbis love. Uh, one meaning of this verse for the ancient rabbis is this. Whenever God was about to speak Torah, God revised it four times. This is in our Torah portion. Every time God was about to speak Torah, God rethought it and rethought it and rethought it. We don't know what the, the original version was. We, we don't know the edits, the drafts, what's on the cutting floor. But it says, when it says, God, ra'ah, God saw what God was going to say, and told it and found it lacking. Hechina prepared it over again, and investigated it deeply. And only then did God speak. That's one of the beautiful interpretations in our Midrash today. The other interpretation is how God found Betzalel. One part of the Midrash is Betzalel was there before creation. Everybody was set out in destiny. Uh, it says that God would not have created the world uh, had God not known that there would be Torah and there would be people to receive Torah and that B'tzalel would be there able to render God's thoughts into the physical world. Another tradition is that God didn't know, that God had no idea who would be doing this. And at this point in history, uh, it says, Va'azra'a, God looked, meaning God looked around at all the people and said, I don't know which one of them is, is qualified. Vayisapra, and recounted or told, or counted. Um, I can make a nice, dry, nice drosh here because the word vayisapra is also the root of the sapphire. Uh, if Sherry and I want to go there, we can go back to Exodus chapter 24, where um, God is presented on brickwork of sapphire. That's the first revelation in Exodus 24. So I think there's something here about the idea that God was looking who stood upon sapphire, who had skills with sapphires. There's a very deep mystical connection between God's presence and uh, sapphires. Hechina prepared him vegam hakara and investigated deeply into the soul of Bitzalel. Hakara lachkor is to investigate deeply. God had to know who was this person to whom God would entrust the building of the Mid Midrash? And then the book of Job seems to respond to itself and say, uh, God said to man, behold, it says the fear of the Lord uh, uh, is wisdom. Of course, the Hebrew is yirat, which means uh, awe. What, what is the core of wisdom? Awe, A-W-E. The deeper the awe, the deeper the wisdom. It goes back to my talk last night. What it means to go deep, deep, deep inside and experience the God beyond God through this uh, sense of awe. And uh, with that, what, uh, what does one know? Sur mera bina. What is bina? If you have awe, then separate yourself from evil. That's the first thing. Once you have that awe, don't think and do destructive things with that awe. Now, of course, after this, we have the, the, uh, the recitation of the Sabbath. Uh, the stones are put together, and you finish chapter 31. I got to tell you, you finish chapter 31 on such a high. It's like finishing uh, Genesis chapter 1. Uh, everything in its order, B'tzalel, the, 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 prototype, the prototypical human being, is all set up to go. The people have been given the Sabbath. The tablets are all there, and everything is ready for perfection and redemption. And then, Sherry, we have Genesis, we have Exodus 32. What happened?
Thank you, Rabbi. Great segue. Okay. Um, yeah, we are at a loss to figure out what happened because, um, but unfortunately, we do have a blueprint in Torah that every time we reach a wonderful high in Torah, it seems like there's a quick fall. I don't know if it's that we cannot sustain because it's too much for us to stay on that level, or if uh, there's a pause and, and all of our fears return to us. But regardless, we see over and over again that as soon as there's a wonderful high point in Torah, then um, for the most part, we'll read about the people took to complaining or the people uh, sought complaints when they didn't have anything to complain about. We'll get to that in the later Parsha uh, when there was nothing for the people to complain about. And it literally, the Torah tells us the people looked for something to complain about. <laughs> So I think that's a reflection, unfortunately, of our nature. And if we keep that in mind, maybe we can guard against that propensity. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm so glad that you talked about how this Parsha reflects back to um, the beginning of uh, Breshit, um, because I saw that as well, not just with Bezalel, but unfortunately with the downfall part. And I was going to talk about... Um, a Tale of Two Siblings, part two, and kind of continue my conversation from last week. But I think I'll take a, a different tack. And then if there's time, I can go back to that. And that is uh, because obviously we see a huge break, um, a huge rupture in the relationship between Moshe and Aaron. Um, if you'll go to um, chapter 32, um, it starts out with the people saying that Moshe had delayed. Now, whether that was a misunderstanding or um, whether the people let their separation anxiety take over, um, their, uh, that they couldn't stand to be without Moshe. We know that, um, that Moshe left um, Aaron and her in charge while he was up at the mountain. Um, Joshua was also there, but he was basically at the base of the mountain waiting for Moshe to come down. So we didn't have uh, Joshua back with all the people, our military man, somebody who perhaps could have taken over when things went wrong. So um, Torah tells us that, um, that Aaron was left with her and they were charged with, if things come up um, while Moshe is gone, if the people need to be judged, then you guys will do that. And we know um, a little bit about Hor because he was one of the men who was on one side of Moshe during the battle with Amalek that kept his arms raised. Joshua was, one, was on one side, uh, I'm sorry, Aaron was on one side, Hor was on the other. And if we remember this battle with Amalek when Moshe's hands became tired um, and his he lowered his hands, then Amalek would prevail. So they stationed her on one side and Aaron on the other to, for them to support him and keep his arms up. And then eventually we won. So we know that Hur is a significant righteous person. Um, and the Midrash tells us, uh, well, where was Hur in this when the people gathered against Aaron? Why isn't Hur mentioned? The Midrash fills in with um, uh, that this, the, the people were so upset and so angry that they they um, became a mob and became violent or at least threatening. In fact, the words um, you'll see in, in 32, um, one right at the beginning of this unfortunate parak, uh, it says the people gathered around Aaron, but, but actually the words used, um, this al with an ayin as opposed to an aleph, it has a menacing, um, quality to it. So just like when the people gathered during Korah, it's the same phrase. So there, there's something menacing going on here with the people. They didn't just come up to Aaron to have a chat with him. So we can read in reasonably from the text that he felt threatened. And what the Midrash says, um, because Hur is not mentioned here, is that uh, this mob uh, coalesced around both of them and perhaps uh, Hur tried to stand up and uh, fight against them and he was killed. And that's why we've never heard about him again in Torah. So uh, if we presume that to be true, uh, then we can understand that um, Aaron was doubly frightened. He was frightened because there was an angry mob and he was frightened because they already um, killed Hur. 
But as we know, um, our commentators and the Midrash go to great lengths to preserve the reputation of our heroes. So there's one Midrash after another explaining why Aaron reacted as he did, which was to immediately suggest that the people remove all the gold, give them to him, and he melted all the gold, threw it into the fire, and then fashioned it. In the first telling, it says that he fashioned it into this calf. And, uh, and that became the golden calf and something that the people worship. So we're horrified with this. How could Aaron immediately have this kind of reaction rather than trying to talk sense into the people? Um, there are some Midrash that, um, that give us a more palpable explanation for this, that, um, that he was uh, playing for time that he was hoping that when he asked the people to give them all their gold, that they would say, well, I don't know about this. I don't really want to give up my gold. And in the meantime, he was hoping that um, Moshe would show up. But um, but there's other Midrash that said that they were so hungry to have this replacement figure uh, for either God or for Moshe that they gladly and immediately gave up their gold. And unfortunately, things moved quickly, even though, um, Aaron may have had the motivation just to suggest one thing after another in the hopes that Moshe would return in the meantime. That didn't happen. So, um, so we're horrified by this. Um, and then uh, Moshe comes down the mountain um, and he sees what's going on, even though God had already told him what was going on. This is so interesting about the power of, of being able to see something versus only hearing about it. Um, so while Moshe was up on the mountain, uh, God said to him, you better get down there. The people are cavorting with this, um, this image, this idol, and I want to destroy all of them, set you aside and start over with you, Moshe. And uh, Moshe has this very elegant speech uh, with God where he pleads with God not to destroy the people, and he gives all kinds of reasons why God should not. Very interesting um, a blueprint for how we can effectively argue in many situations. So, for example, Moshe says, uh, all the peoples of the world then uh, will think that you're not a good God, that you just took the people out into the desert to destroy them. Think about your reputation, God, is the implication here. Um, and uh, the second argument was you made promises to Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. You need to keep those promises. You repeated them over and over. Really effective arguments. Uh, God listens to this and God is persuaded. Uh, and in fact, we, we get the words that he reconsiders um, his plan to annihilate the people. And of course, we're immediately jarred by that phrase because it's similar wording when God reconsidered and regretted in uh, Breshid having made man. Uh, of course, what happens then is he does destroy. He, he puts Noah aside in the same way that he suggests to Moshe that he'll carve out a place for him and start over with him. Um, but here, Moshe is persuasive. So how interesting is it that, um, of course, we know that Noah doesn't argue with God. And perhaps if he was an effective orator in the way that Moshe was, that there would be no flood and, and everything would, would go differently. So there seems to be a repair and also um, an impetus for us to, to argue. I mean, this is a wonderful thing about our tradition uh, that we don't see very much in other traditions. And that is we are encouraged and in fact rewarded for arguing with God. So, so God listens to Moshe here. And, uh, and then the conversation up on the mountain finishes and God gives Moshe the tablets. Um, and uh, before he comes down, I, I just wanted to mention um, the last thing that, that God tells Moshe is not about the building of the Mishkan or about Bezalel and Oholiav. It's not about the priests. It's about remembering Shabbat. And we have the verses to the Veshamru right there, the, the beautiful verses that we sing every week. Um, and then he hands Moshe the tablets and um, Moshe comes down the mountain and sees what God had told him he was going to see, but, but it has a completely different reaction. Um, 
uh, when, when Moshe actually sees what God described in words, or however God spoke to him, <laughs> um, and from that we understand, which, which we've been taught many, many times in Torah, that words are unbelievably powerful, speech is unbelievably powerful, but seeing can really access that part of yourself that can be very emotional and often will lead us astray. In fact, we have a verse, do not um, be led astray by, um, by what you see. So um, Moshe was able to argue passionately and reasonably with God, even after he heard uh, what was going on at the bottom of the mountain. But like God, once he saw it, he also got angry. In fact, there's the same words are used. Um, God's anger flared up. And uh, when Moshe came down the mountain and saw the people cavorting with the golden calf, his anger flared up as well. In fact, we know that he threw down the tablets and they shattered. Um, so what happens next, and this is part of my tale of two siblings, is that, um, is that Moshe confronts Aaron in a, in a really human way. And he says to him, um, he said, what does, and this is in verse 21, what, what did this people do to you that you brought a grievous sin upon it? And um, and we can understand Moshe confronting Aaron in this way. And Aaron does a retelling of what happened with a couple slight but important differences. For example, in the first telling, he, he actually says that um, he melted the gold and fashioned it um, after it was melted and fashioned it into a, um, into a golden calf. But in the second telling, when he was confronted by Moshe, he says, I threw the gold into the fire and this calf emerged. So we read that and we cringe a little bit because we see that this is Aaron trying to evade responsibility. And this also takes us all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And uh, I'd like to comment on that rather than go in more about um, about uh, the relationship between Moshe and Aaron. So why is this important? So we learn that everything we need to know about human nature, we, um, we learn from, from various stories in the Bible, specifically um, the sin of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and then this, the sin of the golden calf, and then later on, the sin of the spies and the Korah rebellion. Uh, if we dissect each one of these stories, we see that um, at the root of these sins are all human emotions that we can identify with, desire, fear, envy, uh, a level of unholy ambition, that's, that's uh, Korach, and all of these lead to our downfall, at least in the stories. And uh, we also learn that not accepting responsibility for our words and our actions uh, lead us to distorted views of reality and narratives that serve selfish ends uh, with little resemblance to the truth. So part of Aaron's response was his desire to avoid responsibility when he was being confronted by Moshe in, I would say, arguably a harsh way. Um, so there's a couple lessons that we can learn from this. Um, and these are lessons about how to rebuke. And uh, Rabbi Finley has taught this many, many times. And, um, and these are difficult lessons. They're difficult for the person who is rebuking. And they're also difficult for the one who's listening and being rebuked. Um, it's difficult to rebuke with kindness, especially if you, the rebuker, is the one who's just been injured, or at least you, you think you've been injured. So it's important that we rebuke with um, kindness and compassion and love. And hopefully there's a foundation that you have with the other person that's built on that so that there's a trust and they can receive what you're saying in a way that, um, that they understand that you are on their side uh, you're trying to guide them to the truth of what is and to be a better person rather than to react in a defensive way. But here, to me, Moshe, and we understand Moshe's point of view also, he reacts um, 
really harshly. And what happens with that is that um, I believe that leads to Aaron trying to evade responsibility. And so they're, they're, he's veering away from the truth because of this harsh rebuke. So the lesson to me is try not to injure or punish with the truth. Uh, when you feel right about something, and in fact, when you know you're right, such as such as uh, Moshe was here um, about his uh, interpretation of what happened with the people, uh, there's a temptation to use any available words to make a point, because when you're right, you feel justified. Um, but just imagine if the conversation went completely differently, if, if Moshe had spoken to Aaron and said something like, I know what these people are like. They are difficult, they complain, and if they combine together into a mob, they can be dangerous. I can only imagine the pressure on you while I was gone. Please tell me what happened. So we can kind of imagine things going in a completely different direction if Moshe had spoken to Aaron that way. Not a completely different direction with the people, they had already acted, but a completely different direction in this sibling context. So now I want to go back to the Garden of Eden a bit, um, because we have a similar kind of confrontation after um, Adam and Eve eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and God confronts Adam and says, have you eaten of the tree from which I commanded you not to eat? Well, imagine Adam hearing this confrontational question from God, just like Moshe's confrontational question to Aaron and Adam responds, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. So we read this and we think, ah, look what Adam is doing. He's blaming God for creating Eve and giving Eve to him. Um, now, God also confronts Eve and says, uh, she says, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So we, we like her response a bit better because at least she doesn't blame God. Um, <laughs> but we don't like that their first reaction is to blame rather than take responsibility. Um, and, and I think that's why it's so refreshing and courageous when we read the stories about Yehuda and later King David, Yehuda's story with Tamar when confronted, um, he says, she is right in as much as I did not give her my, my son. Um, he publicly takes responsibility for his actions of withholding his third son from her. And of course we know famously with King David with, when uh, Nathan the, the wise confronts him with the little allegorical story about a man who has many sheep and there's one man who only has one little sheep and the man with many sheep takes away the one little sheep from the other man. And, um, and, and this is Nathan's allegory about what King David did with taking Bathsheba, the wife of another man. And King David famously says, um, I have sinned against God and accepts responsibility. So it's no coincidence that both Yehuda um, and uh, David are from the same line that eventually we're, we're taught leads to the Messiah. So how important is it to accept responsibility and, um, and even state it publicly, um, which takes great courage and, um, and other uh, important traits, um, recognizing one's own weakness, um, not pushing responsibility off of uh, onto someone else. I mean, we have had guys remember President Truman. He had a plaque on his desk that said, "The buck stops here." So when I think of Yehuda and and uh, King David, I think these are two great men who both have the plaque, the buck, the buck stops here on their desk. So why am I um, talking so much about? Um, about um, Brashit and this intertextual connection that I see here, um, because this is one of the parshas that makes me wonder every year, why did God create us in the first place? And, um, and in fact, uh, some of our sages say, we're not even supposed to ask that question, but it's okay for us to ask that question. Um, I, I wonder, was God lonely? Was God bored? 
did God want to give this great gift of life to mankind, which is his ultimate creation, um, hoping that goodness and truth and holiness would emerge rather than the dictates of the Yetzer Hara. Uh, the problem is, yes, we are B'Tselem Elohim, we're in the image or shadow of God, but we are not replicas of God. So in that space between being an actual replica and whatever the implication is of being an image or a shadow, that's where all of this potential destructiveness is and havoc gets wreaked because that's where free will comes in. So, um, so since we are not God, um, we are at the mercy of our Yetzer Hara and our thoughts and speech and actions can be wildly unpredictable. So this leads me to believe that whatever God's motivation for creating us, um, it was a it was an act of faith on God's part, the same type of faith that I think about when, if parents are thoughtful, when they think to have a child with all the hopes and dreams that go with that. And of course, knowing that there will be disappointments or even tragedies, um, but both acts, God's creating us and parents creating children are, are wonderful acts of, of love and faith. Um, so back to why God created us in the first place. And here's my kind of heretical idea. In the first creation story, you'll, you'll see that God created one being, uh, kind of a hermaphrodite being. The text tells us it's male and female contained in one. And I'm thinking as a possible explanation for our creation that God intended this first creation to be a companion to God, a creature with whom God could have a direct I-thou relationship. Um, I, I won't say a, a, someone that could complete God in some way, but but to have this, this wonderful relationship that perhaps God was craving and felt was a lack on God's part. Um, so God created Ha'adam this way. And, um, and and Adam ventures out and he sees that all the other ad, uh, animals and all the other creations, the living creations, have counterparts. They each have separate male and female. And, um, and he felt an aching loneliness. He didn't see anyone that corresponded to him in, in that way. And that's when God said, uh, it is not good, Loto, that man be a, a, uh, alone. And we know that in each stage of creation, God pronounces um, his creation as either good, tov, or very good when it comes to man, tov me'od. And this is the first time we hear of a low tov. So to me, this is a, this is a real interesting moment in the story of, of creation. Um, it's not just about man's loneliness. To me, it's about God's first disappointment, meaning that this is God realizing, if you if you like my uh, midrash, God realizing that His great hope for man, this man, to be a counterpart, an Ezer Konegdo, so to speak, uh, for him, um, is is not going to turn out the way that that God had hoped. So, in the second creation of man, um, God uh, creates him from from the earth, which is how we get the the name Adam from Adama. Um, and then while Adam is asleep, he takes out part of his side and, and shapes Eve from that. And, um, and Eve has been created as an Ezer Connecto, a counterpart uh, to complement man and also to be opposite to him. Um, because Adam wanted a flesh and blood counterpart, just like all the animals had. So how does this relate to Moshe? And here's a, another part of my midrash that we know so much about Moshe, but um, but we know very little about his wife, for example, Zipporah. Very very small uh, ink is is spilled about Zipporah, uh, and even less about his sons. So it's my belief um, that God was trying to recreate in Moshe this 
ideal relationship that he had hoped would take place with Adam. Um, he wanted Moshe to be a God knower and, um, and we know that God certainly knows and understands Moshe. Uh, Moshe has sacrificed so much in his personal life, not only being a leader of B'nai Yisrael, but also to have these profound mystical experiences with God um, unparalleled in Torah. I mean, even in, in just our Parsha, we know that um, that Moshe was up on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. It says that during that entire time, he did not eat, did not drink. Now we can read this like a fairy tale, but if we read it in a different way, and that is that somehow Moshe was able to enter the realm of God where, where normal rules don't apply, that he was just on a completely different plane um, that, that no other human being has attained. And so to me, this is a description of, of the relationship that God had hoped would be uh, between God and, um, and Adam. A, a melding of the two realms. In fact, um, the Mishkan, one could say, is that space for God that somehow um, intersects with our world just like, and, and that is therefore an intersection of space uh, between God's realm and our realm. And just like Shabbat is um, that part of time which intersects with, with God's world. So we've got some, we've got a holy space, which is the Mishkan. We've got a holy time, which is Shabbat. And normally the two realms are separate. It's very dangerous for them to coincide and intersect. But these are the way that God pretty much reaches out to all of us and says, you may not be able to have the relationship with me like I had with, with Moshe, but I'm giving you this Mishkan that you can take wherever you go. In fact, I'm planting it inside of you and I'm giving you Shabbat which is a little taste of what it's like to, to spend time with, with God. So these are two wonderful gifts for us to come close to that relationship that we know um, Moshe had with God that is like no other. Um, the last thing I wanted to say about that is that... Um, is that at that moment when God realizes that there's not going to be the type of relationship between God and Adam that he had anticipated and therefore makes Eve for Adam, that in that moment, I see it as just an incredibly generous act uh, and, and kindness because at that moment when Eve is created, um, that dream of God's is lost, so to speak. That dream of that type of communion and ultimate relationship between two of them is lost. So I, I just, I'm amazed at how generous, kind, and loving that act is. Um, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Do you have some pushback for that, uh, uh, Rabbi? Um, sure. No, no, no pushback. That was. Uh... Wonderful. And uh, um, some of this you and I have discussed before. I find it just a, a really beautiful uh, uh, Torah that you're teaching. Uh, I'll, I'll just say a couple of things as far as why the human being was created. I love the Kabbalistic answer is that the human being comes into being because of the tragedy of divine brokenness when the, when the as it were, the vessels shatter. And as the vessels uh, shatter, uh, they fall into a lower realm. The lower realm is both created and is the place where the vessels shatter. And in that lower realm is where the human being comes into creation. So this is a strange idea that we are there, as it were, to receive uh, the, the, uh, the aspects of the divine that have been released with the breaking you might say the the uh, as it were the evil or the disruptive within divine that was held in perfect stasis with the ain so now has been released and descends and we are the ones that carry the breakage of god so i remember when i first began studying the kabbalah there there is as it were no reason to create the human being we are the result of a divine tragedy and we carry the breakage uh, that was enough for me um, it's just a fact. 
We carry the breakage of God, and now what are we going to do with it? What will we do with the breakage of God? So in our relationships, we experience the breakage of God. In our own life journeys, we experience the breakage of God. We look through history, we see the, the, the breakage of the divine. Uh, when it comes down to this Parsha, I just want to point out a couple of things. Uh, you know, when, when Sharon and I both described uh, Exodus chapter 31 with Betzalel and the Shabbos and how it goes back to, uh, to Genesis and everything is, is great. And then it comes to the next part where they reject. You know, does it remind me of you as you were talking, Sherry? Is my many years working at a, uh, a 12 step recovery center. Um, I, I want to take this at just two very brief angles that uh, y- you might say when the recovery is presented to a person who's ju- just checked in. The first thing is profound skepticism. This has this has not worked. This has never worked. I've always left recovery. What makes this difference from any other time? Now, part of it is doubting the system. You can't you can't affect me. You can't fix me. Of course, as self doubt, which means I can never be changed. When when when, as you beautifully pointed out, when Moses said, "What happened to you?" And Aaron says, these people are bent on evil. So the person arrives in recovery and says, you don't know my secret. I'm bent on evil. I'm irredeemable. Nothing good can happen with me. Uh, I'm going to relapse. I'm going to run out of this place. And you will have wasted your time. My my family will have wasted their money. It's all going to have an open again. You know, and, and part of what the clients try to do is demoralize us. And my response, as I think about it, is to come back with Batsalel, which is, I see something in you that you can't yet see. I see Batsalel. Yeah, you see the people with the molten calf. That's very clear. You've been doing that your whole life. But I see Batsalel, and some part of me believes, if I can get them to see what I see, then the path of recovery will come. And I think that's part of our core missions as human beings and the intersubjectivity where we mirror ourselves to each other, we have to mirror to our, to the other that we can see the Betzalel in them. We can see the image of God in them. We can see people endowed with wisdom and, uh, and d- discernment and understanding, people who are the, uh, able to create beauty and to create goodness because people can't see it in themselves is sometimes it takes the other person to say, here's what I see in you. Trust me, I see this. And I remember so many times in in recovery, they would challenge me to, how how do you see this in me? What do you see in me? I can't even see it in myself. And uh, when I look at Moshe, I don't like Moshe here because Moshe sounds like the angry parent. What? You messed up again? You didn't do what I told you to do? You're a rotten person. And I look at Moshe and I say, I've seen guys like you destroy one kid after another. Would you please find some common sense and not ruin your kid? You know, so it's as if Moshe and God are in collusion. Let's just destroy these people, kick them out of the house, exile them, banish them, disinherit them. Something happens to Moshe. You know, it's like something happens to that, not usually both, but one parent in recovery says, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. First of all, I'm going to forgive my kid. I'm going to forgive my kid. Right? When, when Aaron said, look, these people are bent on evil, the kid did not choose to be that way. Nobody chooses to be an addict. They wake up and they're an addict. And I see this, the Moshe saying to God, and I, again, I don't have a perfect analogy set up, that God is, as it were, culture, society, everybody, you are damaged goods, I just want to get rid of you, which how many people treat their uh, addicted children. And Moshe says, I see you worth. I see worth here. You have to forgive them. Don't forgive them for what they did. That's part of it. Forgive them so that they, be, so that they can become who they shall become. So in many ways, forgiveness is not past-directed. It's future-directed. And last thing I'll say is as same as self-forgiveness. Self-forgiveness isn't I forgive myself for what I've done because some of us have done things. We, we carry guilt and shame and we say, how can I ever forgive myself for what I have done? Well, what you say is, the rest of my life, I will make good on that. I will show that I have been worthy 
of forgiving myself and propelling myself into the future, which is a way of bringing uh, uh, God's forgiveness and goodness down. So I, I want to thank you, Cheryl. You did a beautiful, beautiful job here. And of course, as always, your teaching inspires in me thoughts that I hadn't thought before about this Parsha until I listened to you. And it's great that we have, we all have this effect on each other where we, we, all, we see things because of able teachers who, who bring out things that uh, we would not have seen without them. So that's my response. Uh, I want to thank you for a really uh, erudite and uh, beautiful teaching. Thank you. And now you're-